Welcome back to the channel everybody. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be doing a Q&A styled video. If you don't already follow me, uh, I'll be putting up some more Q&A questions on my Instagram. You can click uh, right there. It's going to be at Andrew Ridzik, so just my name. And uh, maybe I'll answer your question. Actually, probably I'll answer your question. I don't have that many followers. So if you do answer a question, chances are I'll probably be able to get to it and uh, answer it personally in the next Q&A video. So feel free to follow and ask as many questions as you like. I like answering you guys' questions and it kind of stimulates a better conversation for me to directly talk about one certain point as opposed to think of a broad general topic and then try to explain things the way through. So feel free to ask me any questions and I'll be sure to get to it in the next Q&A. So jumping right into it, uh, and I have these questions written down on my laptop because I'm filming with my phone. So, um, question number one is, what are some of the biggest fitness myths? So, I'm going to go with three. I'll answer like three of them. So, number one is going to be like the anabolic window. And most people kind of already know this is a myth. Um, it's kind of like a tall tale back in like the old and bodybuilding days and basically the anabolic window was just talking about like if you didn't slam down a protein shake within like 10 minutes of training then that whole training session was useless and you're not going to build any muscle and yada 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 and that's just simply not the case especially if you have a meal before you train um, you already have all the energy and nutrients in your body that's still like being digested still going to be in its processes of being converted into the necessary molecules that it's going to build up the muscle later. So you have all the necessary components and building blocks of building the muscle in your body already. So there's no need for you to slam down some more protein just to be able to digest it and then build it back up again later. So it's not to say that you shouldn't eat after training. It's just that you don't need to slam down protein right after you train or else it's like useless. Now, if you're someone that trains fasted like me, I always train in the morning fasted just because I like it. I don't like training on a full stomach. It's not that fasting training is any better than um, fed training. If you're someone like me that trains fasted, I still don't even put that much effort and time into thinking that I need to slam down a meal immediately. Um, I'll go on about my day. If I'm busy and I have things to do and I just can't eat a meal in right after I train, then I won't and it's not a big deal. Um, I just make sure I get enough protein in a given day. Uh, about one gram per pound of body weight in a given day of protein and that's going to be more than sufficient enough to build the muscle that I want and recover from the stimulus of training that I've had in a given day. Doesn't really matter about the meal timing there. So just as long as I get enough protein in a given day, I should be completely fine. Number two is going to be targeting fat areas and a lot of people, especially like my parents and stuff like that, whenever they're talking about it, they think that they can do like specifically crunches or like ab workouts to target like belly fat specifically or like they want to lose fat specifically on their legs or like their cheeks to get a jawline and this and that. But the truth of the matter is that it kind of just comes down to your genetics and just where the body wants to pull fat from. And so there's no mechanism that the, you can tell the body to like, you can pull fat here. Like you can't just do ab crunches and it's going to burn the fat around the specific abs. Um, that'll give it the energy to do the ab crunches anyway. So when you're doing ab crunches, the thing that you're doing is like you're training any other muscle. If you're training a bicep curl and you're doing curls, you're just working the muscle. And that's all you're really doing with your abs. Your abs are just a muscle. So if you're doing crunches and stuff, what you're doing is just supplying a stimulus for that muscle growth later. So you're just breaking down the muscle little by little, and then your recovery, like your food and your sleep and all that's gonna help build the muscle back up. So when you're doing ab crunches, you're just building up muscle, assuming you're recovering fine. You're not burning any fat around it. And so fat burning or fat loss really just comes down to an energy deficit because fat is just a stored form of energy. And some people I heard the other day getting pedantic about like, oh, well, fat's not technically stored energy. It's all like the molecules that are stored there. When the molecules break that have the bonds, that's what supplies it of energy. Anyways, I digress. That's a whole different like rabbit hole that I'm gonna get down into. But basically fat is just stored energy. So the idea is that you want to be burning more energy than you consume. 
And then that energy has to come from somewhere, right? Because the law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, just transferred or transformed. And what happens in the body is that it's going to transform the body fat into usable heat energy. So when you're moving around and stuff, you're going to exert that energy out into space as heat energy, right? Like when you sweat and when you're working out, you get hot. So that's where that energy comes from. So the more you move, the more you're going to burn. And um, that's where that fat loss is really going to come from. So I did mention too that it's going to come down to your genetics and I'm really interested in the genetic component of fitness and health specifically in general and I think it's going to be a field that's really up and coming and growing within the next few years and so a lot of people when they're talking about like oh you just should choose your parents better as like a joke basically and like oh these things kind of just come down to genetics oh well and I don't like the way that it's kind of targeted to be like, oh, well, there's nothing you could do about it. I do think there are things you can do about it. And a lot of people don't know that the human genome has been completely screened. So we know all of our genes and it's just the process of like going in and analyzing it. And what does that mean for health and interpreting it a certain way? And I think within the next few years, there's going to be a lot more genetic understanding of that component into our health and fitness levels. And so specifically, I mean, for the purposes of health, there are genes now that we know that can contribute to like type 2 diabetes. For example, there's a gene, the TCF7L2 gene, which encodes for GLP-1 protein, which is like pro-insulin. Um, and basically what that's going to do is that if you have a gain of function mutation in this gene, I shouldn't say mutation, more like variant, but if you have a gain of function variant of this gene, the TCF7L2 gene, what it's going to do is it's going to overproduce insulin from a genetic component, right? So it's gonna, it's already in your cells. So your body is like ingrained in your DNA to overproduce insulin if it's a gain of function. And so if you have higher levels of baseline fasting insulin, your body's more susceptible to become insulin resistant over time. And then as we know, if you're insulin resistant for too far of a time, that bleeds into type two diabetes. And then your body is not responsive to that insulin. And so you have higher blood glucose. And so I think there is a strong genetic component when it comes to health and fitness in general. And I think a lot of people kind of know this, but they kind of use genetics, like the term genetics or genes, as like a scapegoat for the things that they don't know. And they just kind of chalk it up to like, oh, well. But I look at it more of like, yes, it is your genetics, but why don't we work with your genetics to see what is the best course of action for you? And a lot of people just don't understand it because it takes a lot of time to interpret. And there's more science coming out now that a lot of people just aren't willing to understand how genetics works for that purpose. It's kind of easier to say like, oh yeah, I just go in the gym and do hypertrophy and then eat protein and all that's completely true. But I do think that in terms of like nutrient partitioning, that would require a strong genetic component which would code for the hormones and the molecules that are going to facilitate either muscle growth or fat loss and how some people are more genetically prone to be um, at a higher body fat set point or a lower body fat set point but i think there's ways to work with your body not against it and the fact that we can now like screen our genetics we can have a whole genome sequencing and we can know our genetic makeup now so that we can work with it and not against it. So that's just something I've been getting really interested in. And if you don't know, that is what a lot of my coaching practice relies on too. So it's a lot of the normal fitness industry and the fitness and health advice. So obviously like you still have to put in the work of like exercising and eating right and all that stuff. But there is a lot of debate, and we'll probably get into this more with the questions later, about like, should I be eating higher or lower carbs or like vegan or keto or intermittent fast and this and that. And I think that while there is no diet practice that is necessarily like bad, I do think that there is a best diet practice for you and a best lifestyle practice for you because the best diet is the one that you can stick to. And if we know genetically which diet is best for you from a health perspective and how your body actually wants to operate that, why wouldn't we look at that? So that's kind of um, one of the things that I do that's unique. So if you do want to get coached by me or just have your genetics interpreted 
and you can get coached by somebody else, but at least you know like where to start. You can click the link in the description below. Uh, it'll give you a free consult call with me. We can see where you're at, see if we're a good fit, and then we can move on from there. If not, that's completely fine. You can just subscribe, keep watching the videos. I'll give plenty of advice. The thing I say a lot of the time is that in this life, you can kind of pay in two ways. It's either with time or with money. And so I think that if you don't have the money, then that's completely fine. You can just do it the way I did, honestly. So you just trial and error. It's going to take a lot of time and effort to figure out what's right for you. You're probably going to have to go through many, many different styles of eating, many different styles of training. There's going to be a lot of headache along the way. And you have to be very meticulous in the ways that you sort of regulate how you eat and how you live your life and that's completely fine but you are just paying with time and with effort but if you do have the money i would highly recommend that you get your genetic screen so that you can start off on the right foot working with your body and eliminate all the time you would have technically wasted trying to figure out how your body actually works so there's the trial and error method of figuring out how your body works and that you just pay with time and effort or you can just pay with money and uh, if you have it, completely fair if you don't, but if you do have it, I think that it's going to eliminate a lot of the time and effort over the course of years that you would have to do with trial and error and not seeing results and wondering why you kind of feel bad and whatnot as you're dieting and as you're training. So if that's something that you're interested, please feel free to contact me down below and I'll be happy to get back to you. And so the third fitness myth that I would say is that you can't build muscle while losing fat, and you most certainly can. Now, it goes without saying that it is much harder to build muscle while you are losing fat because, as we talked about before, losing fat means that you have to be in an energy deficit, meaning you're eating less than what you're burning in a given day. So if you don't have the necessary energy to really like build up the muscle, it's going to be really hard. However, that's where you have to be a little bit more meticulous in your nutrient partitioning, which basically means eat enough protein. And how much is enough? It's going to come down to eating a little bit more than you normally would if you were not trying to lose fat. So I mentioned before that about a gram per pound of body weight is more than sufficient to build muscle. If you're going into a cut, maybe just eat a little bit more. How much more? Enough to where you're still seeing your strength and your training efforts are still being able to be recovered and you don't feel like shit going into the gym and training later on a cut. So if you notice that over the course of a few weeks when you are losing fat, that your strength is going down and you don't have as much muscle, you might have to incorporate more protein into your diet. And if you are seeing your strength go up and you're still building muscle and you're taking it slow, so that's the, the next point I'll bring up. But if you still are seeing that muscle growth and you're still strong and your your weights are going up in the gym, then you're eating enough protein and you're doing it fine. And then so point two is that you're going to have to take that energy deficit very, very slow. A lot of people just want to lose fat very quickly and it's understandable. But the more you crash diet and the more that you drop the energy expenditure, it's going to be very hard to use that little amount of energy to go into recovering and building that muscle because the body needs to still function and do its normal activities. And if it comes down to keeping you alive with energy or to build up your biceps with energy, the body's always going to choose to keep you alive. It doesn't care about how big your biceps are, if it's 15 or 16 inches, it doesn't really matter. So, um, Take the cut slow, the slower the better, and you're gonna see that over the course of time, you're going to lose fat, you're still gonna be able to build a little bit of muscle, or at the very least, you'll maintain it. So it is a really big myth that you can't maintain or you're gonna lose strength um, when you're on a cut or trying to lose fat. And um, for most people, that's certainly true because they take the cut way too hard, way too quickly, because they wanna lose the fat right now. And so, if you want to do that, it's completely fine, but just notice that um, your strength is going to decrease. But if you take it slow, I promise you, you can build muscle and get stronger at the same time you're losing fat. So that was a long question one, but we're going to get into question two, which is the thoughts on carnivore diet or vegan diet. I mean, if you want to, you can. Um, there, it, It's heavily debatable that... Um, there, there's two schools of thought basically. So there's a school of thought that like red meat is bad because it's inflammatory and it has saturated fats and it's going to raise your cholesterol, cholesterol levels and you're going to die of a heart attack. And then there's the other side where it's, it's coming from nature, it's good food 
and it's all natural and it, there's nothing bad with it because it's meant to be eaten and we've eaten it for hundreds of thousands of years. And I think that it's probably a combination of both, honestly. And the reason why I say that is because both these schools of thoughts have good evidence to support their reasoning. And so you can find a bunch of anecdotal evidence on either side that they're both true. So how can that possibly be? If they're complete opposites, how can both be true? And there's people that eat the carnivore diet and are completely healthy and have actually gotten way healthier than when they were eating a different diet. And so I think, again, a lot of it might come down to your genetics, at least with the cholesterol and like the heart attack sort of areas. So um, there are genes that control the regulation of cholesterol in your body. And so if you are someone that has a variant in your body, that like PCSK9 gene, which would control your cholesterol levels. If you have a, a loss of function mutation of that gene, um, you're going to have higher cholesterol levels in your body. So if you're susceptible to that, which about 4% of the population is, the carnivore diet wouldn't necessarily be the right choice for you. Why? Because again, red meat has a lot of saturated fats and it's going to raise your cholesterol levels a little bit. Uh, so if you're someone that is susceptible to uh, cholesterol and are, is very sensitive to those plaques that are that would build up in your arteries that would cause a heart attack, then yeah, don't eat the carnivore diet. But if you're someone that's not, um, I think that the carnivore diet's fine. I personally wouldn't want to eat meat 24-7, but that's just me. If you're you and you like that, then that's completely fine. Um, but that's just kind of another reason why I think it's it's very important to get your genetic screen because you can kind of figure all this stuff out and how you should be eating and your lifestyle um, practices and your training practices too, that would be the best for your body. Like why wouldn't you wanna know what your body would want to do um, as opposed to like guessing and eating a certain way and kind of hoping that you're fine. So that's just my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's my thoughts on the carbo diet. Vegan diet, again, kind of the same thing. If you wanna eat vegan for like diet practice purpose i think most vegans kind of eat for like the moral practice purpose of it so that's fine too yeah definitely but um again even for like the diet practice purpose i i like the idea that it's a very low calorie dense um diet it focuses on a lot of fruits and vegetables everything comes from nature it's not processed so and again i think all of these diet practices while there are such while there's such a dichotomy between them they're all alike in the same ways. They all focus on non-processed foods, foods that come from nature, um, lower calorie dense foods, things that'll fill you up, that are natural, that your body can handle, that it can eat. Um, it's just a matter of like, are you getting in enough vitamins that's right for you? Again, controlled by your genetics. And is it something that you can sustain and keep in the long term? So if you hate fruits and vegetables, then vegan diet's probably not the best diet for you. If you hate meat, then carnivore diet's probably not the best for you. So it is kind of just coming down to whatever diet's the right one for you. And so that is a combination of your personal preference along with your genetics. Number three is going to be, should I be cutting or bulking for summer? Up to you, my man. I don't really know. I mean... It really depends. So it depends where your where your set point is at too right now. So if you're on the on the skinnier end, there is the idea of like your body type. So there's ectomorphs, which is like skinnier, typical like you're very very lean, low body fat percentage, but it's harder for you to build muscle, so you look kind of skinny. Then there's like mesomorphs, which is like an in between, and then you have your endomorphs, which is like your heavier guys. You call them big boned, I guess. And it's like you have a lot of muscle, but you have a higher propensity to store fat. And so if you're someone that wants to get into like that mesomorph looking range or someone that just looks muscular and lean at the same time, um, kind of depends where on the scale you're at right now. So if you're someone that's an ectomorph and you're skinny, probably bulk up a little bit. I mean, you can probably afford to put on a few pounds of fat while gaining muscle at the same time uh, at a higher rate than if you were to cut. So yeah, I mean, if you're that way, then bulk. But if you're someone that's already got a lot of fat and you want to um, get into a range where you can see abs and feel confident and, and happy in the summertime, I guess, even though that your happiness level shouldn't come from abs. But if that's something that you're just striving for, then um, yeah, cutting might be a good option for you. So it really kind of just depends where you're at. 
Number five, hybrid training. Overrated or underrated? Um, I am a huge fan of hybrid training. And hybrid training, for those that don't know, is basically high amounts of cardio paired with high amounts of resistance training. So basically, you're a weightlifter and you're some sort of endurance athlete at the same time. And so the idea behind this is that you're just going to have multiple streams of fitness. So you don't want to be a complete bodybuilder where you can't even run a mile, but you also don't want to be a complete runner because you want to have a lot of muscle on you and you want to be strong. So you get the best of both worlds. Now, the more you get into it, the more you're going to realize that you're either a jack of all trades or an ace at one. And so the deeper you get into hybrid training, meaning the higher amounts of cardio and training you get into, assuming you're recovering both fine, um, which most people should be, if you're doing it right at least, is that you can only be so good at both at the same time. So you can either be really, really good at strength training or like hypertrophy being a bodybuilder and having a bunch of muscle or really, really good at running or pretty good at both. And so I don't mind just being pretty good at both because I find both very enjoyable. I like running a lot. I'm getting into boxing a lot, which is very cardio intensive. Um, and I still love my strength training. I was a power lifter and um, I do like bodybuilding a lot too. So strength and hypertrophy is something that matters to me. But I also like the feeling of being able to run long distances and going for long runs um, on a nice day. So I want to be able to have the cardio stamina and the endurance to do that. So would I be or am I as strong as I would be if I just focused on strength and like powerlifting? No. Am I as fast as I would be if I were to just focus on running? No. But I'm fast enough. I'm strong enough. And I enjoy both. And it's something that it'll keep me interested in my training for probably the rest of my life because you can always progress in um, in these areas of, of training. So I personally like it. Try it out if you want to and just make sure you're eating enough and getting enough protein in because the more you train, that provides the stimulus for the recovery. So the greater the stimulus, the greater the recovery that you need. And so get enough sleep, eat enough protein, recover well, and uh, yeah, you should be good. All right, that's all the questions that were for today. So not a lot of questions, but I feel like I kind of dragged out a lot of those answers. Um, yeah, feel free to follow my Instagram. I'll link it down below in the description and keep asking me questions or just DM me with questions in general and I'll probably get back to you. And if there's a bunch of them, I'll probably make another video of them and um, I'll be sure to get back to you guys. So go follow that. Hit the subscribe button for YouTube as well so you don't miss out on any videos that I post up here. I'll be doing a bunch of different style videos, um, whether that's coaching videos, programming videos, training videos, Q and A's, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to start posting more. So feel free to click the bell button and the like and comment all that bs just do it down below so you can help me grow and spread some good information to more people so i'd really appreciate that guys uh anything that i'm linked to is down below in the description again i mentioned that if you want good quality scientific coaching from me that not a lot of people and by not a lot i mean like no one is doing because not a lot of people and again no one really un understands genetics um Feel free if that's something that you're interested in and starting off right, regardless of your fitness level. If you're someone that's just starting out and you want to get started on the right foot, or if you're someone that's an elite level athlete and you want to push it that extra 1%, um, feel free to let me know and I'll help you uh, achieve those goals. So uh, that's it for today. So I will bid you all adieu. I will see you all in the next one and bye.